Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 38 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we're discussing chapter 37 of A Game of Thrones. That's Bran 5. As always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully, we'll provide you with some entertainment along the way. We will summarise what's happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the TV show, indulge in a little pedantry, and uh, cover some reader feedback. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide you some additional information about the characters and other things of note in this chapter. How are you, sir? I'm doing all right. How about you over there? Good, glad. Not too bad, not too bad. um, I've been a bit sedentary because of the whole... uh, I, I, I sometimes think as we're talking like this that we have to sort of think of posterity. Right. You know, in, in centuries to come, people will hear this and they won't have the, the temporal context. So I need to explain. Right. We are still under COVID-19 coronavirus lockdown. And so we're That's right. recording remotely. And uh, I've been a bit sedentary because of that. Yeah. Not getting enough exercise. So I made a, I made a deal today with the fam to uh, every hour at 55 minutes past the hour, we get together, the three of us, and we do five minutes of exercise. Okay, okay. That's a good so idea. Today, yeah. yeah. I've done 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups. Nice, all right. <laughs> I am aching all over. <laughs> Since quarantine started? <laughs> yes, because we... <laughs> that that does day. work out at like one a day. But <laughs> in my defense, until today I was at zero. Okay, so... <laughs> all right. It's been a distinct uptick yes. in the amount of exercise I've done. Yeah. No, I, I I have been playing a bit of tennis, so I've not been completely sedentary. There still. you go. Yeah, Ethan and I had been working out together um, like three or four days a week, but our schedules are so opposite because he sleeps till past midday most days, and I like to get up and work out in the morning. So uh, ultimately, it was like two weeks ago, we were like, okay, I'll do my thing on my time. You do your thing on your time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you how you parent a college kid during this because I mean, I mean, I've got a a high schooler, and so I can at least say you've got to get up and do your high school work, which is it's a sliver of what he would be doing, but at right. least it's something. Yeah. But if it's a college kid, I mean, I mean, first of all, I'm talking softly now because he might hear this, but the times when he's asleep are the happier times in the house. You know? <laughs> so the, the last thing I want to do is encourage more of the uh, we're awake at the same time thing. But he has got to get up and do his work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our kids are, they're uh, becoming more and more Rickon-like every day. They're basically just raising themselves. <laughs> Who knows what times they go to bed. Stacey and I go to bed like about 11 every night. I'm pretty sure they're up for at least another five, six hours before they go to bed, based on their wake wonder, up times. Yeah, I wonder how long it was would take us to shoehorn a Rickon reference into the show. <laughs> it took. I, I, yeah, we didn't even get to the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I listened back to that whole conversation about Rickon and Rickon fostering uh, Robert Aaron, I, I. I thought we were quite funny. I did too. I usually do think we're quite funny. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else agrees, but I think we make, we make me laugh. Well, if you, if you look at our numbers, then nobody does. <laughs> it's just us. No, no. We're, we're very grateful for our fans. Thank you for listening. We appreciate you. Yes. We've had two fantastic, oh, three or so. Really, things have really upticked. And the, I th- I'm wondering if maybe people were busy doing other stuff during the uh, initial few weeks of the COVID-19 quarantine. And now they're, and now they're bored like, out of their gourds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's listen to these guys again. We've got nothing else to do. It's, it's going to be the making of, as I tell you. <laughs> All right, let's get down to business. Oh, I've got one other thing before we start, actually. My uh, my dog. So I went out. <laughs> I have like a screened-in porch, yep. which for people who don't live in the south of the United States might not mean much. But um, if you go outside about eight months of the year, you'll get eaten by mosquitoes because they live out there and they eat human. Yep. Um, a screened-in porch is like a porch with screens instead of windows. And those screens keep the mosquitoes out. It's absolutely glorious to be out there. I just love it. It's oh, my right favorite now. room in the house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Um, We have just off the screen porch, we have a little deck, which is not screened in. 
So that's where the mosquitoes live. We went out yesterday morning and the deck was covered in blood. Oh. I mean, just covered. Me and Lucas were looking at it and we were like, it looks like someone's been murdered, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And, and our little dog had killed some multiple things. Oh, wow. And just okay. thrashed their bodies around up there and just... It looked like a crime scene. It was awful. Twiggy. And you, you, who knew? Yeah, when... little. I know <laughs> that little innocent face. The monster. And now, now I can't escape the glint in her eye. Now <laughs> she, she keeps wanting to go back out there. I'm like, no, no, come on, you stay in here. Oh, and I mean, I had to, I had to put one of the things out of its. I'm not even going to talk about what they are. It's too horrible. But I had to end its yeah. life because it was oh. suffering and and i'm not good at that kind of thing no me either. i mean i'm i'm really not good at it you know i mean like <laughs> i can't eat meat which is like you know five <laughs> layers removed from the dying of the animal oh god so i'm i'm traumatized by this poor things so let's read a gory book shall we all right let's get on with it let's do it. Right, a quick recap of what bran was up to last time we saw him last time we saw bran It has been quite a while. He was uh, receiving plans for a specialised saddle to allow him to ride again from Tyrion Lannister. He was hearing news of his uncle Benjen's worrying absence north of the Wall and very sweetly sleeping with his big brother Rob because both of them were feeling lonely from the absence of their parents. And just the two of them. No Rickon. Where was he? (laughs) (laughs) Forgotten again. Uh, uh, so they were missing their parents and also they were beginning to think that winter really might be coming uh, Rickon I guess we was with the wolves anyway why don't we give them the summary so Bran is out for his first ride on his horse Dancer Dancer's saddle is fashioned from the designs Tyrion gave Bran when he passed through Winterfell on his way from the wall Rob is riding with him along with Maester Lewin Theon Greyjoy and some other Winterfell men uh, and, of course, the dire wolves Summer and Grey Wind are present and accounted for. Dancer was selected for her exceptional smarts, and Bran has ridden her inside the castle a multiple times as the two have learned how to use the saddle together. The group rides through the near-deserted village outside of the castle. The village fills up in the winter. Bran, now feeling comfortable in the saddle, wants to ride faster, so he and Rob race ahead of the group, the wolves running along with them. The pair eventually come to a halt miles outside of town and out of sight of the rest of the group. Rob decides to fill Bran in on the happenings with their father in King's Landing. Bran is sad to hear of Jory Cassell's death and scared about his father's injury and uncertain recovery. We also learn that the boys know about Cat and Tyrion in the Vale. Bran liked Tyrion, but the name Lannister gives him an icy feeling for reasons he can't quite put his finger on. Bran having lost all the joy of the ride, wants to go back home, but Rob wants to find the wolves first. The pair lead the party off the King's Road into the wolf's wood to look for the wolves, soon outpacing the rest until the boys are out of earshot of the party. When they hear the wolves howl, Rob rides off to find them, leaving Bran alone. Bran hears what he thinks is the rest of the party arriving, but turns to find a group of unknown men and women. The group is ragged and clearly not from a local farm. They quickly surmise that Bran is a lordling and order him to give them his fancy silver pin and his horse. Bran notices that two of the men wear the black of the Night's Watch. Clearly, they've deserted their duties, and he recalls what happens to the last Night's Watch deserter he met. A woman in the group wants to take him hostage and sell Bran to Mance Raider. Rob appears, and so do the wolves. A bloody fight breaks out, and when it's over, all but the woman wildling are dead. Rob decides to bring her back to Winterfell for questioning. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. So we're back in Winterfell. Yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. I looked it up. It's been uh, 13 chapters. 
the last uh, brand mm. episode we had was on March 9th. So it has been uh, well, a long he, time. He, on, until today, he wasn't going anywhere, really. Well, but now yeah. <laughs> he's now he a dancer. <laughs> World's at his feet. That's right. So, yeah, the horse riding goes well, which is good. Yeah. Brand's been yeah. practicing inside Winterfell, but this is his first gallop. And yeah. uh, he's able to keep up with Rob. So, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. that's good. They said that Dancer was particularly smart and basically never wore a, an ordinary saddle. So this is all she knows in terms yeah. of uh, uh, being ridden. That was um, that was on Tyrion's advice when, when he gave... Bran, the design for the saddle, he mentioned that the horse should be young, smart, and having never been broken in before. So right, right, right. So they ride through the near empty village. I, I, I didn't realize, I didn't remember this winter village on the outside of Winterfell, but I guess it makes sense. I mean, Winterfell has these uh, hot springs warming its walls. Uh, a village huddled up against those walls makes a lot of sense, you know, because uh, yeah, yeah, c- keep you warm in winter. So Bran mentions that. Uh, the, currently, this little um, uh, village outside of Winterfell is near empty, uh, but as winter approaches, it will fill up. And he says that, you know, he gets this information from old Nan because he himself has never seen a winter. He said as, as the winter comes, the farmers will abandon their crops and their distant holdfasts, and the, I think as she puts it, the winter town comes alive. Right. So... Um, not to put you on the spot with anything, but Bran is seven years old? He's eight. He mentions eight, in this sorry. chapter, remember, he says, I'm eight. Uh, I'm near as right. old as you. That's right. Um, but how long has the summer been going? Is that? I think it's years. nearing ten years. Nearing ten years. So he really has. He really is a child of summer. Yeah. So Bran thinks about how uh, Rob seems to admire and enjoy Theon's company, which is interesting because Bra- Theon... Theon's a, an odd character to us because we can't we're not quite sure how to peg him at the moment. Yes. I mean, he is he is hostage slash ward of Winterfell. He has obviously he enjoys some privilege for yep. being that. Right. He seems to be he seems to have been basically accepted. I mean, certainly we've we've commented before that Kat seems to prefer uh, Theon to John. Yeah, she she divulged. <laughs> well, at the time, it seemed like a big deal when she divulged. The uh, secret about uh, Cersei killing John Aaron in front of Theon. Now we know <laughs> that's just what she does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and actually, that, that's that's going to come up again a little bit in this chapter. Is is well, actually, in the TV show, there's going to be a it will be an interesting comparison with the TV show there about what Theon hears. Oh, but okay. uh, Bran and John. Brad mentions that John never warmed to Theon, and he himself has some sort of hesitations about Theon. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's a, it's very he interesting did. dynamic because Rob, he seems like a pretty trusting guy, and and that that could worry us a little bit since he is the uh, currently the Lord of Winterfell. If he trusts a little too much, that could get him into some some trouble, yeah. I guess. But Theon's clearly got some personality, and, yes. and he's clearly he's clearly not cowed to be a hostage. He's right. clearly you know comfortable being there. Yeah, feels that he's part of the family, or near near as makes no difference part of the family. Right. It, it, it kind of along those lines. I was wondering if maybe what Rob admires so much about Theon is that he's, in a lot of ways, he's very different from Rob. He he's so carefree and he seems to uh, in this chapter he's um seems to really be up for some fun and uh you know those are things that at the moment especially rob can't be he's got to be lord of winterfell he's got the responsibility yeah. of being heir to um to ned stark so maybe he it kind of embraces like theon can do these crazy things and report back and he can kind of live vicariously a little bit through him yeah but of course i mean Thinking big picture, I mean, Theon is the heir to the Iron Islands. I mean, he too is heir to a major house, right? So that that will come to him too. Yes, uh, but I guess I guess when you're not there, I mean, maybe if he was in the Iron Islands, he would be acting more like a lord, right? Know? Yes. Here he can be, you know, pampered teenager. Yeah, he seems. To... Although I mean, it's Winterfell, pampering. <laughs> You've got a fur. You have a fur coat to wear, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
But, you know, I also found it... Um, ah, Rob. Don't I say it. Said, don't say I it. I almost said it. <laughs> I, it Penny all, in the jaw. <laughs> it struck me that Bran has never warmed to Theon because Ned wanted to... Was Ned was very excited about... Not excited. But Ned was very looking forward to bringing Bran with him to King's Landing because he thought... Bran is the easygoing, the peacemaker, the get along with anyone kind of guy that could bring these these families together, and yeah, yep. yet he, he specifically said that, yeah, but yet he's never warmed to Theon, and it doesn't really feel like Theon's ever really warmed to him. I don't ever get at least we've only been a few chapters, but it doesn't feel yeah. like he's um he he doesn't seem to have the big brother instincts that John and Rob have for Bran. And he's not his little brother, so I guess there's that, but, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure that then that um, Bran could have done much, really, with uh, Joffrey Baratheon, because... Oh, yeah. he He's a lot worse than Theon <laughs> Greyjoy. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah. Theon's he... a little brash, a little arrogant, you know, could, could do with kind of calming it down a little bit. He's no Joffrey Baratheon. <laughs> right. <laughs> If you, if Bran can't make peace with this one, there's no hope. No, for the other one. yeah, Ned was uh, Ned was biting off a little more than he could chew with that idea there. <laughs> so the boys are alone after their gallop. They're miles outside of town. Bran's elated, uh, but he notices that something is bothering Rob. Yeah. So Rob is not sure what he should tell Bran. I mean, Bran is only eight, as right. I c- correctly predicted earlier. Um, <laughs> But Bran says, well, look, I'm heir after you. You know, if you fall off your horse and break your, break your neck right now, I need to know the things that you know. Yeah, yeah. he makes he a good point. He didn't say those bits. Right. <laughs> but, you know, that is a good point. And that is, I could see Rob's concern. You want to tell him things because he is next in line at the moment. But at the same time, he's just a little boy. So, And Rob's not much older, so he doesn't have a lot of experience in how much information he should divulge. Yeah. But so, I mean, basically, Rob is convinced and yeah. spills the beans. He tells, we sort of get this sort of long exposition about what's going on in the world. Yeah. And you can tell but, he mentions that Rob is, um, sounds sad and scared when, when he starts to tell Bran these things. And it just made me think about what an awful spot his parents have put him in. I mean, he's a boy playing Lord and. You know, it just seems like more and more things keep getting piled on his plate. Well, yeah, yeah. He I mean, no the, the, the worst, the worst part of it, and is, I mean, he he could run Winterfell. You know, I mean, there's not much to do. You know, right. yeah. just don't let the walls collapse. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> make sure that people can come into the Winter Village when winter arrives. You know, that kind of thing. But the problem is, is now he's faced with the the challenges of what should the Stark's response be yes. to the things that are going on. Yeah. And that's that's a consequential decision which is uh, way above the pay grade of a 14-year-old. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're just, I mean, you wouldn't want to, and, and I mean, honestly, it actually doesn't really matter about his age. It's obviously more difficult for a 14-year-old. But if you were 30 and you were the heir, yeah, you wouldn't know what to do. You wouldn't know what to do because you're not in charge yet. Right. Once you're in charge, you can make the decision and stand by it. Yeah. While you're not in charge, but being forced into the decision, you're always going to be second guessing yourself. Right. Is this what they want me to do? Right. Is this what know. dad I'm wants me to do? Is this what mom wants right. me to do? I don't know. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm in the middle of watching Succession on HBO, which is quite an interesting show. I kind of, I'm not. I'm not all the way through it yet, but I, I slightly recommend it. It's okay. Very, it's, it's is that intriguing. that's the one about the wealthy family? Yes, exactly. And we watched yeah. the pilot, but that's all the further we'd made right. it. Right, right. There's, there's a funny um, discussion after the fact in one of the episodes. One of the episodes, um, I think Kieran Culkin. Like oh, Paul yeah, Culkin's Macaulay's younger, younger brother. brother. Yeah. He's, he is one of the children of the rich guy. Right. And the, ri- the rich guy is played by Brian Cox, who's a br- British actor who's very good. And uh, the scene that Kieran Culkin was describing was one where... Brian Cox turns on him and sort of fixes him with a steely glare and makes him quiver and quake kind of thing. And Kieran Culkin says, that was the easiest bit of acting I've ever had to do. Said, that was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Sorry, 
I digress. You know, hey, we need these we need these updates on shows. Right now, people need to know what to watch. Yeah, yeah. So we also get the first reference of the phrase dark wings, dark words here, which is a, a phrase that comes up from time to time. It, it means that when you get a raven, it's more often than not going to be bad news, basically. That's a good point. And good so point. some of this information we get, they kind of mix it in. Some of the information we're about to give comes from Rob telling Bran these things, and some of it comes from ravens they've received in the past, you know, in the recent past, that Bran already the, knows Re- about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just kind of thinking about them while Rob's telling him these things. So so basically it's no further news on their uncle, Benjen. He's still missing north of the wall. Yep. That their mom is in the area with Tyrion. Their dad was injured and Jory was killed. And that they... Rob has ordered uh, Moat Kaelin to be uh, bolstered with more defenses. Right. Now, Moat Kaelin, we had talked about back in Eddard 4, we talked about the uh, strategic importance of Moat Kaelin. It sits at the northern part of the neck and defends the north from the rest of the realm. And um, everyone but Simon believes it to be impassable to a hostile force. Simon has some reservations on that, (laughs) about that idea. Do it. Do I? I don't. I don't remember that. You, I, I was just thinking. I was thinking about it again, and I was like, "Yeah, they're probably right. That probably is impossible." But <laughs> what? What? What did I say? <laughs> You've said in the past that they could that a, a force coming from the south could lay siege on those, uh, could build siege engines and just pound those towers. There's three towers that that guard the northern. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the neck, and they could just. You know, pound those towers with the uh, catapults oh. and everything else until that's interesting I, you know what i'll give myself some kudos there because i think that's true i mean okay i'll give you this general mckelly would you rather lay siege to moat kaelin or to the uh the eerie? gates of the moon eerie no i mean the the no the oh the bloody gate the bloody gate that's what i mean yeah oh boy yeah uh well they're both uh, they both present challenges but but the bloody gate is more ha- has more um substance to it mo Kalen is just three towers i think whereas the bloody gate is a big structure a big gate blocking the road and the whole time i'm doing it i'm sending half my force round with a ship <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> landing behind them <laughs> coming up flying uh, Stark banners and they <laughs> slip all their throats. So, yeah, I, I think that Moat Kaelin is definitely more vulnerable. But hey, you know, I mean, definitely it's the right time to send more troops there and bolster it. No yeah. Question. yeah. So, and I think we also talked a little bit about Moat Kaelin in one of the uh, cat chapters because we were talking about her choices and one of them was to go north. So I think we did talk about it. Yeah, so if, we, if she got to Moat Kaelin, she would have been fine. The Actually. issue was getting to Moat Kaelin. The, the one thing I will say in favor of killing ourselves at the bloody gate instead of Moat Kaelin is that I think Moat Kaelin is pretty swampy. So yes. it'd be like those mosquitoes would be getting you the whole time you were laying siege. Yeah. And that would be really miserable. So, they don't have screened in porches uh, either. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so Kat, uh, Kat's situation with Tyrion uh, gives Bran some confusing feelings because on one hand... As he puts it, he kind of liked the little man. But, on the other hand, and I'm going to read the exact quote here, the name Lannister sent cold fingers creeping up his spine. There was something about the Lannisters, something he ought to remember, but when he tried to think what, he felt dizzy and his stomach clenched as hard as a stone. I think I missed a word there. I think it was something about the name Lannister. Anyway, you get the idea. And to me, that sounded a lot like Vertigo. Like, if you were somewhere up really high and you were afraid you were going to fall, you might feel dizzy and your stomach might might, uh, clench as hard as a stone. I see where you're going there. Uh (laughs) Bran Bran should pick up on these clues. Right. (laughs) Because the reason you're afraid of the name Lannister Bran is because they pushed you out of a window. Right. Yeah. But but it wasn't Tyrion. You remember in his dream, he started to to, uh, think about that whole situation with... Jamie pushing him out the window, and the crow said, "No, put that out of your mind. You don't need that right now." So, I guess it's still I am nodding out of his in mind. agreement. He uh, 
Still hasn't recalled that. So Theon catches up to them, and Rob transforms back from Rob the older brother confiding in the younger brother to Rob the Lord. Yep. Yeah, he touches the pommel of his sword and says to Bran, uh, no matter what happens, I will not let this be forgotten. Which, I wonder if that was just some bravado for Theon's sake, or, you know, he didn't seem like he was about to say that before he saw Theon was approaching. But he, he's talking about his father's injury, right? That's yeah, what he's referring the, to. Yeah, right, the, yeah, yeah, the injustices the North has suffered at the hands of the Lannisters, yeah, I yeah. believe, is what he's referring to. Yeah, so Theon, again, coming back to this situation of Rob is forced into making consequential decisions without true authority and not knowing what the people in true authority would have him do, Theon's all for calling the banners and going to war. <laughs> <Right>. Because <laughs> it's much easier when you're not actually making the call. Yeah. Sounds like a little bit of rashness of youth right there. You mm-hmm. know what that reminds me of? This is a bit of an obscure reference, but the Office fans might know what I'm talking about. When uh, Dunder Mifflin is in uh, dire financial straits and uh, Oscar, who's one of the accountants in the Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch, he's going on and on about how easy it is to fix these problems. All you have to do is this and this and this. And so Michael takes him to all the big bosses and He's like, okay, I've got the solution. This guy's got all the answers. And uh, Oscar's like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... I think that's an, actually a very good uh, analogy. I think I think those two situations are entirely analogous. Yeah. Analogous. I think I think if Theon was said, okay, if Rob said, okay, then you're the new Lord of Winterfell. Have at it. <laughs> Theon would be like, well, now... <laughs> did I say... Did I literally say that to all the banners <laughs> <laughs> but uh so then bran asks well what does maester lewin think and theon's response is uh, that lewin is as timid as an old woman and bran reminds rob that both of his parents took lewin's counsel and rob says i do i listen to everyone and and i was thinking yeah. oh boy is the eight-year-old the most level-headed one we got in this conversation here? <laughs> well, I mean, an eight-year-old versus two 14-year-olds. I mean, eight-year-olds think with their brain, you know. Good point. 14-year-olds, not so much. Not so much, no. No, I, I really think, actually, Rob is a pretty... He's been pretty level-headed for a kid being stuck in this position. But I do worry that Theon, who is the same age and clearly has some uh, rashness about him, is also giving him counsel on how uh, we don't need the North being run by a pair of teenagers, you know? <laughs> yes. I, I would trust Rob to run the North. If he was, if it, Mr. Lewin was his chief counselor, right. I would not trust Rob to run the North. If Theon Greyjoy was his chief counselor, right? <laughs> that it's not a good situation. No. <laughs> so Bran points out the fact that only a Lord can call the banners And then Theon, in all his wisdom, says, if your father dies, Rob is the Lord. And, you know, Bran kind of freaks out and he shouts, he's not going to die. And Rob has to calm him down. And uh, I was like, come on, Theon, the kid's eight. You can't say something like that in front of an eight-year-old. Yeah. But then um, Rob Rob calms him down and he says, oh, you know, kind of telling brand that everything is gonna be okay he says father told me to be strong for you and and <laughs> there's someone else i swear it was you and <laughs> Hodor, you, ma- old mr man. lewin <laughs> the wolves oh there are three wolves <laughs> that Why must mean something <laughs> oh, he says uh, for you and rickon but well, as soon as he's ever uh, you and rickon that's what popped into my head <laughs> who <laughs> i like it um, so Bran, a little bit upset now, wants to go home. Uh, Rob says they wants to find the wolves first, which, uh, as you made the point, the wolves seem pretty independent and able to look after themselves. Yeah. They are dire wolves. Right. That comes up a couple times in this chapter. <laughs> I put it in penetry because I was just like, huh, that seems unnecessary. Yeah. But anyway. Um, <laughs> the, I was in a work conference the other day on a conference call. And uh, I was talking to a, a lady that we work with and something happened with her video. And then 
she was she was replaced by a huge white dog on the couch where she'd been sitting and it honestly goodness looked like she'd been eaten <laughs> i was like are you there <laughs> and I then the she wrote she wrote back yeah i'm here i'm like okay but what awfully big hands you have <laughs> Did a whole Red Riding Hood. Yeah, I was very yeah. pleased with myself. So Bran recalls Jory t- taking Rob and Bran and John fishing. Bran caught nothing, but John, being John, gave him his fish. Yeah, good old um, John. So now he's kind of getting more and more upset. You know, he's never going to see Jory again because Jory was killed. And now he does he think does will he ever see John again? Yeah, and you remember back in uh, the last Bran chapter when they were kind of laying together at the end of the chapter. Rob said, We're, when, Mom, when Mother gets home, you and I will ride up to the wall and we'll surprise John. And can you imagine the look on his face when he sees you a horse? He must have just forgotten yeah. that plan, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, but hearing everything he's hearing, he's got to be thinking the time when we're all back together again is getting is receding, not yeah. approaching. You know, and This actually made me think of something because he asks... Rob this brand asks Rob this question and Rob's response is well we saw Uncle Benjamin when the king rode north um, you know way back in the beginning of the book and that made me think is that the only that can't be the only time Benjamin's been around because he just seemed too the the kids seemed too familiar with him and so I, I went yeah. back and read the John I think it was John 1 chapter and he John is sitting there, and the line is, he hears a familiar voice behind him, and it's Uncle Benjamin. So, clearly, he must come down, you know, whenever he needs a, a change of pace from whatever they eat up at the wall. Turnips. You see, I think it's I think it's forgotten that King Robert Baratheon, first of his name, did enact some uh, very progressive labor laws, which meant that even the Night's Watch got three weeks paid right. vacation a year. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin comes down all the time. You know? <laughs> all right. So the the group, the party splits up again because Rob and Bran ride off into the wolf's wood looking for the wolves. Yeah, and uh, Theon falls back. He and the guards are kind of laughing and joking. And then uh, next thing you know, they're out of earshot of Rob and Bran. And the boys hear the wolves howl. And Rob decides to go find them solo, which... Seems to be a bit of a stark trait to just leave kids by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, but how could Bran say, hey, wait, don't leave me alone? Because I mean, like, what about Rickon? Right. Rickon could cope with this. <laughs> I'm guessing Rickon's with the wolves right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't be such a wuss. Rickon <laughs> lives out here in the wolf's wood. So Bran's all alone. Um, he hears Lee's rustle. He thinks it must be the rest of the party joining him, but it's the ragged group of uh, people. Four men, two women. They immediately spot his rich clothing. Hey, yeah, and then he says to them, they said, you lost little lordling in the, you lost in the woods, my little lord, or something like that. And he says, no, my brother just rode off and my guard will be here soon. And I was like, well, that, that is a dead giveaway that you are uh, a wealthy young man. Yeah. But if you if you say it like this, my God will be here soon. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Right. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? My guards. <laughs> oh my wolf. <laughs> <laughs> so the the kind of the voice of the group says, "What are they guarding? That uh, fancy silver pin you got there?" And uh, Fran notices that not only are they wearing filthy clothing, but Two of them are wearing filthy clothing that were once black and yeah, realizes yeah. that uh, they're deserters from the Night's Watch. And that made me wonder, Garrod must have been wearing his uh, black cloak and stuff as well. And I thought, couldn't they find some change of clothes somewhere along the way so that they're not so obvious to spot? It'd be like step one, get out of the garb that only members of the Night's Watch wear. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, 
audibletrial.com slash ghostsheronhall. You can find the link in our show notes. Interesting thought. If you could just like flounce through Winterfell in a big scarlet boa. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah, right. I'm fine. He looks a bit ragged for that scarlet boa. Don't worry. <laughs> I just thought, man, it seems like they all forget the like most important thing is don't look like a brother of the Night's Watch when you're deserting think, the Night's Watch. I think the problem is that everything they wear is black, though. So, I mean, the thing is, they'd have to find something, and there's, like, nothing between Winterfell and the yeah. wall, you know? They, there's no one to steal clothes from, you know? Maybe uh, make a pair of trousers out of something. <laughs> you know what? If I lived in Molestown, which is the town just south of the wall... Yes! That is a business right there. Hey, <laughs> find a need, fill a need. <laughs> <laughs> Get your fancy brown clothes right here. <laughs> Thinking of deserting? Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. McKelly and Simon's tailor shop first. <laughs> oh, and we could do a sideline selling them out to the stars. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, you know, like those and, kick me signs that people wear? <laughs> if people put on other people's backs, we could put one on the back and, of the cloak that said, Deserter of the Night's Watch. <laughs> and we sell their black stuff back to the Night's Watch as well. This, right. is, this is, idea is money. So little overhead. Uh, anyway. We'd have to live in Molestown. Yeah, that's the downside. So, yeah, he, he remembers, we remember back to chapter one where um, Ned Stark told Bran that there's no one more dangerous than a deserter because they know their life is forfeit already. Yep. So they're not going to flinch from any crime. So Bran is rightly afraid. Yes. Kind of the, the leader of this group is named Stiv. And Stiv wants <laughs> Bran to get... <laughs> With a name like Spiv, you're not long for this world. <laughs> <laughs> he wants him... He wants Bran off the horse. And Bran says, literally, I cannot do that. And uh, then he he says, what are you, some sort of cripple or something? Because Asha realizes there's like he's all strapped to the horse and stuff. And he says, I am Brandon Stark of Winterfell. And that's when Asha, who we discover is one of the two women in the group, says, hey, let's take him and go sell him to Mance Raider. Mance Raider would pay a fortune to have a relative of Benjen Stark. And Stiv is like, do you want to go back there? Do you think the White Walkers would care that you've got a hostage? Yeah, that's a, it's a relevant point that because, I mean, I think wildlings come across the wall occasionally to raid south of the wall, mm-hmm. but yes, they do. That that they're doing it. This this is an interesting one because they're not. I know I just used that word, but they are. They're not just here to get some food and some money and some hostages or whatever and go back north of the wall. They're here escaping north of the wall. They're afraid of what's north of the wall. So either they're running from the White Walkers and Asha thinks this is worth turning around, undoing everything we've did, getting back around the wall to get Bran to Mance Raider for whatever big reward we're going to get. Or she's not really thought it through, I guess. Yeah. Or or maybe maybe they're just like a, a... a marriage of convenience this group yeah. maybe they didn't really have a plan they they were just heading south together and yeah. they fell in with one another right i can't imagine the deserters of the night's watch wanting to go north of the wall <laughs> for example they could have just gone north of the wall <laughs> right. that's a just good point. shimmy on down <laughs> so just a reminder a man's raider he is the also known as the king beyond the wall and back in the second chapter it was uh cat one ned told cat that it must be the wildlings causing so many desertions and deaths in the night's watch and that he might need to call the banners and go deal with mance raider once and for all but this seems to be a mashup of deserters yeah. and wildlings so yeah I, I think i think it's becoming clear to you and me that the frequency of desertion from the night's watch is more to do with the impending threat from up there right those who've become aware of it are getting out of there. Yeah, it definitely Risking. feels like these guys, this group, aside from maybe Asha, <laughs> they are fearing the White Walkers and have fled the North. Yeah. So when Stiv um, slashes the straps that hold Bran in 
place, uh, he he cuts Bran's leg, but Bran doesn't feel it. He just watches the blood bubble out of his leg, so yeah, that's not nice. And then a voice from somewhere else says, Put down your steel, and I promise you a quick, painless death. Which he tried to say with as much conviction as he could, but unfortunately, being a mid-teen boy, his voice cracked in the process. <laughs> which could have probably was from fear, but also could have been because he's a mid-teenage boy. I promise you a quick and painless death! <laughs> <laughs> I thought, man, that's not the greatest sales pitch right there. You know, maybe <laughs> put down the steel and I'll give you ten gold dragons. Uh, <laughs> but instead he went with the quick painless death. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> yeah. That will come up actually in the uh, comparison with the TV show. Because oh, okay. TV, TV Rob makes a different offer. Okay, well, can't say that's not a terrible idea. Because, uh, ooh, yeah. ooh, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Quick and painless. Kill me now. So, so wait. Let me get this straight. There's six of us. <laughs> One of you, and you're offering me a quick and painless death versus a death in a fight. Well, I think I'll fight. And that's basically what what Asha says. She says uh, she seems to be the only one trying to avoid a fight. She says to Rob, "Get off your horse. Give us the venison because." Uh, Rob has come back from finding the wolves and he's got a deer, a deer or an elk or something, but some type of animal draped so, across so, his so, horse. So, uh, just imagery alert. So, am I getting this straight that a pair of dire wolves took down a noble stag, sigil of, of House Baratheon? That's right. I hadn't picked up on that. Mm. So, she says, you know, get off your horse, give us the deer, we'll Thank you kindly, and uh, we'll go on our way. I'm trying to imagine them making a fast getaway with a deer over their shoulders. Like, <laughs> 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 they go about 50 yards and then make a campfire. <laughs> <laughs> but then Rob whistles, and things get evened up a little more in a hurry. The cavalry. That's right. Out from the underbrush emerge summer and gray wind and in this moment i was really hoping that rickon would ride out on shaggy <laughs> but no they did Sh- shaggy rears up onto two legs <laughs> you know I, I did wonder at this point though how come shaggy Ch- shaggy is short for shaggy dog that's the name of rickon's wolf shaggy dog didn't get to come uh on the big journey. That seems unfair. Well, he... who's looking after Rickon? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> That's... That's Shaggy's raison d'etre. <laughs> so the wildlings attack. Rob kills the first man. Grey Wind tackles one. Rob and Osha fight. Um... So I wondered at this point, uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the first fight and kill that Rob has ever had. Probably, yeah. You know, he just started wearing live steel just uh, like the yeah. just a few chapters ago, and yeah, it's, he, and it's not like his dad was making him do the execution, right? Or anything like that, yeah. Right? So this is the first person he's ever killed, and now he's uh, yeah. embroiled in his first battle he's ever been in. Yeah, but hey, it's handy to have two direwolves. Yes, I'll yes, because uh, Summer takes care of Holly, which is the other female of the group, and then uh, a man try. Her last name was Tosis. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't really. So. <laughs> no, it actually wasn't. We don't know what her last name was, but it could have been. It should have been. So, and then one man tries to flee, and Grey Wind tackles him and drags him down, and uh, he dies as well. So now it's just yes. Stiv and uh, Rob and Bran and the yeah. wolves. Yeah, yeah. So Rob has Osha in his clutches, but Stiv has Bran in his, right? Yeah, yeah. He kind of ran her over with his horse, and so she kind of was down and out. But now she gets back up when Stiv grabs Bran, pulls him down off the horse, puts a dagger to his throat, and says, put down your, get off your horse, and put down your sword. And Rob has no choice, so he does. Meanwhile, Asha gets up and gets her spear back and first Stiv tells Asha kill the wolves and she's like you kill the wolves I'm not getting anywhere <laughs> yeah. near those monsters and so <laughs> let, let me hold this spear to the cripple while you right. kill the wolves. so then Stiv changes tactics and 
and orders Rob to kill the wolves or else he'll kill Bran. But we never get that far. Yeah, because something kills Stiv from behind. Yes. Uh, an arrow fired by Theon. Yes, as he put... As, Which is good. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah, yeah. He, as a, Slightly risky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I clearly... Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily think things through all the way, it's clear. And he's 14, 15, you know, mid-teen age. They're known for not necessarily thinking things all the way through, so it doesn't necessarily surprise me that he didn't think through the repercussions of firing an arrow within inches of, of Bran's head. But then Bran says the, the guards all arrive on scene, and he said <laughs> the guards are all pale and sick, looking at the, you know, taking in the scene that's happening, and Jothis is in the bushes puking. <laughs> and <laughs> even Maester Lewin is momentarily stunned when he comes upon the scene. So it um, must have been a pretty grisly the, scene. Well, believe me, I know. I went outside and sold <laughs> oh, my dog dick. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Easily as bad. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was Theon's arrow that killed Stiv, um, came bursting through his chest so he hit him he fired at his back and uh, theon is standing there looking proud and cocky and smiling and that's something that brand mentions a few times in this chapter is that theon is always smiling and theon says a dead enemy is a thing of beauty and i'm guessing it's also his first kill presumably yep. i mean he is a gray joy so it's possible he was uh, killing <laughs> and reaving by the time he was uh, old enough to walk but likely his first kill yeah so yeah i mean i mean rob's angry at theon for shooting at bran essentially yeah but also relieved yeah to have back safely right i'm sure he's got mixed feelings see he says to theon john always said you were an ass and, and he <laughs> theon's like i just saved your brother's life and rob starts ticking off all the things that could have gone wrong you could have missed you could have just wounded him his hand could have slipped and cut Bran's throat. You could have hit Bran. What if he is wearing a breastplate? All you saw was his black cloak. And Theon, yeah. like, huh, yeah. Well, hadn't thought that all the way through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Rob's right. Yeah, Rob is right, no doubt. But, but Theon's right too. A good shot there saved the day. You know, you have in here, is Rob right to be angry at Theon? And so I've been thinking about that since I read it a few days ago in our notes here. And, gosh, I guess it's one of those things, like, yeah, it worked out great, so, you know, cheers all around. It's like when a when a football team goes for it on fourth and inches, if they get it, you're like, <laughs> yes, that was a great decision. If they don't get it, they're like, why would you do that? You should have punted. <laughs> so. You're missing sports, aren't you? I am missing sports, yes. Luckily, I get to throw in analogies sports analogies in every episode That's these it. days. <laughs> this is the this is our outlet for everything. Right. It? So Rob decides that the, the heads of the Black Brothers will be to return to the Night's Watch, presumably as a reminder to those of the Night's Watch who've been measured for outfits at the McKelly and Simon Taylors in <laughs> Molestown, <laughs> that they should stay and fulfill their vows. Uh, but he's curious as to why the Wildlings have come so far south uh, at and as a result, he decides to take Usher prisoner rather than dispatching her, which Theon's perfectly happy to do there yeah. and then. Yeah. Um, he, he, he isn't sure what to do, but Lewin suggests that questioning her would be the right thing. And Rob's pretty relieved. I think he's... Yeah. Presumably, he's had enough bloodshed for one day. And once again, Theon is, you know, impulsively says, feed her to the wolves. You could definitely feel Rob the boy dreading having to do some rob the lord type stuff like having her beheaded or whatever yeah yeah in fact he's lucky in some ways that a, a member of the night's watch didn't survive the fight because yeah he knows he doesn't know exactly what to do about the whole father being injured mother taking Tyrion captive but he knows exactly what he's supposed to do to a deserter right i hadn't thought that <laughs> i hadn't thought about that I wonder if so. If you if you do if you're a deserter, can you take the black? <laughs> <Just come. laughs> I take the black. You, have to, <laughs> you wear two layers of black. <laughs> but you know, this had me wondering. Uh, had me kind of 
conjecturing into the future a little bit. And this might really shake Rob that this could have turned out absolutely disastrously if Bran had been killed. Imagine the guilt that he would have carried around with him had Bran been killed because he left him alone in the woods. Yeah, I think the other thing as well, the other eye-opener of it is as he's sort of like thinking about gathering troops on the no- on the southern borders of the north, he can't empty out Winterfell and the northern parts of the, of the north because right. there's threats from that direction too. They don't seem to be coming down in major groups yet, but... Not yet, but winter is coming. It is, yes it is. We know that. And we know that. what's coming with it. We read yes. it in the prologue. Yes. Yeah, yes. All right, you got some background for us? You know, background was a little bit tough this chapter. There wasn't really a, a whole lot to go on. So I I, I guess I, I, I came up with talking a little bit about wildling ratings. So we don't know for sure if they were down here. We know that the Deserters of the Night's Watch were not down here raiding, but the wildlings probably were also fleeing along with them. But it's possible they were just, a, like Simon said, a band of convenience. But raiding is a common thing that the wildlings do. And so uh, basically raiding is kind of a staple of life for a wildling or the free folk as they call themselves. And starting as early as 12, wildling raiders either climb the wall or use little boats to cross the Bay of Seals to get around it. And Oh, interesting. Yeah, climbing the wall is a long and dangerous effort. And uh, as you might imagine... It can take a full day to scale the 700 vertical feet of ice, and often rangers of the Night Watch find broken bodies of fallen raiders at the base of the wall. A, a full de- day to scale it, but only eight seconds to slide down the other side. <laughs> Whee! That's what they don't, the Night's Watch don't tell them, is there's actually a slide on the other side. <laughs> Raiders cross the wall to steal swords and axes and spices and silks and furs and any other valuables they can find. And they're known to take women and carry them off beyond the wall as well. So, Wildlings use huge ladders of woven hemp, spiked boots, small stone-headed hammers, and stakes of iron and bone and horn to get themselves up over the wall. And then they hit the slide on the other side. So, <laughs> Very good, very good. So in comparison with the television show, it was mostly in line. Um, a, a noteworthy difference is that the book conversation between Rob and Bran is had between Rob and Theon in the show. They are sitting down watching Bran ride, and they're having the discussion about Uncle Benjamin, about oh. Mormon Tyrion, about father being injured, about calling the banners. All of that is a discussion between the two adults in the scene. Okay. Rob Bran occasionally Rob and Theon? Rob and Robin Theon. Robin Theon. Okay. No, Robin Theon. Uh, they're the only three people in the scene. Nobody else is on this trek. It's just the three of them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so so Bran's only contribution to that conversation is riding through occasionally going, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's different in terms of how you sort of see uh, Bran. Yeah, much less. Theon impactful. also see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, Theon seems a little bit more thoughtful, but again, in that position of much easier for them for him to make sort of bold statements about what Rob should do, right? Because he's not actually making the call. So it just we've got different levels of trust in Theon. I mean, obviously, we know that Cat trusted him with her secret that she wouldn't divorce to anyone until she divorced it to everyone. (laughs) (laughs) But we didn't see Rob discussing these things with Theon in the, in the book. He was discussing them with Brad. Right. Yeah. So the reason Bran's on his own in the TV show is just because he's the only one riding. The other two are just sitting there and he just rides off and then gets (laughs) isolated with the, uh, with the baddies. There's only four baddies, uh, because there's no wolves in this oh, scene. Oh, yeah. Okay. Rob takes care of everyone. And what I was saying before, I sort of gave away the fact that I was getting confused between the TV show and the, and the book. He, two of them are killed. Shiv has Bran at knife point. He has Usher at, Bra- at knife point. Oh. Yeah. Uh, standoff until Theon obvious... breaks that standoff. A, well, actually... It, it isn't really a standoff because obviously the person who has the upper hand here is the one who's got a loved one. Shiv doesn't care <laughs> right. whether Osha lives or dies. So. <laughs> That's a good point. So 
Rob is forced to drop his sword, and it's only after he drops his sword that the arrow arrives and kills Shiv. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, the reason that Rob enters the fray on his own, because remember, there's only three of them in this scene now. Yeah. And Rob and Theon were together. It's because Rob offends Theon, and Theon stomps off. When Rob tells Theon that it's easy for him to make these calls because it's not his house. Oh, he say he said this. Yes, he did. All right, so you had some pedantry, which I kind of spoiled. No. I shouldn't have read it before we started. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering. So they get themselves into this situation because Rob insists twice that they go and find the wolves. And that just seems like... It, it feels like they run off and come back all the time. You know, they're... Yeah, they're not. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it was the, Penny missing in the woods, I'd have to find her because she couldn't live five minutes on her own. These are dire yeah. wolves. I think they can handle it. It feels like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the wolves have been out of sight for like fifteen minutes. Right. Rickon has been missing in action for a month. <laughs> Rickon may have been kidnapped already by the wildlings <laughs> and being held hostage north of the wall. <laughs> yeah. But no, let's go find the wolves. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm I'm with you. I think. I think it was slightly artificial way to break up this company. Yeah, I think have. so. So news and notes. Um, so we mentioned uh, Dan and his wife laughing at us. Um, uh, we also had a nice email from Robin France saying how the uh, podcast is helping him get through his quarantine time. Yeah. So glad to be of service. He specifically mentioned it helps him uh, when he's cutting grass. Cutting grass. There you go. Yeah. And uh, we also um, I feel like we're, we're kind of gushing about ourselves here, but we got a really a nice comment from randall and uh, randall said he's amazed at how much he missed when reading on his own after listening to us so well yeah i mean i i a lot of that randall is just because we keep rereading it i mean i, I i'm the same i i obviously we all we've established i have no recall of this from the first time around but i too am finding a lot more in it this second read through than i did the first time so you're like the the perfect co-host for the show because you you kind of want, um, you know, you want you want someone who knows what they're talking about, but also, you know, it's a really helps a ve- having a vehicle to explain things when you have someone who has no idea what's going on. <laughs> exactly, I'm here to ask questions. I'm like, what did I just read, McKinley? <laughs> so you me. are both on one hand someone who knows what's <laughs> happening, and on the other hand, someone who has absolutely no idea what's going on. <laughs> no, you know. So more. is this the hot? Ho- are we at the halfway point? Last chapter was the halfway point. Wow! How about that? Yeah. Only a book one, everyone. Yes. Save right. your tears. <laughs> Save your tears. <laughs> there's, there's plenty more still to come. So. We'll be old and grey by the time we finish this. Yeah. So. Uh, so let's conclude. Yes, let's do. One thing that struck me about um, this chapter is that Rob really only seems to be Rob the boy when he's around Bran. Seems like that's the yeah. only time he shows any real emotions that he's feeling lets his guard down he tears up he you know gets sad and scared and if anyone else is around he puts on the rob the lord exterior yeah yeah but i mean that, that's probably true of most of us you know around our families where we let our guards down you know just his only family that he's with now is brown oh wait <laughs> um <laughs> so you know, maybe he, maybe before everyone departed, he was like that with all of his family. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that that could be. So Theon definitely fly by the seat of pants kind of guy. Definitely likes to have fun. Definitely impetuous. Yeah, yeah he gives. Uh, he's known to give Rob some questionable advice, but hopefully yeah. Rob is smart enough to put in the uh, time thinking it through yeah. that Theon's clearly not doing. Yeah, and like Bran says, you know, the person to talk to is Maester Lewin. I mean, Maester right. Lewin is the one who's got all the experience and you know he's part of his cabal of uh, maesters (laughs) they're running the realm anyway (laughs) they're running the realm anyway (laughs) you might as well do what he says Uh, so more desertions from the night's watch more wildlings south of the wall are these numbers set to increase right yeah i would say yes they've gone from one to six in just half a book right (laughs) they might be at 12 by the end of the first book (laughs) exactly (laughs) And so, you know, these Stark parents might never be coming home. That's uh, another thing we could possibly conclude from this. Well, I mean, hopefully Ned still is. I mean, hopefully Ned, once he recovers from the injury, should be... I mean, that was his plan. Right. 
he was planning to come home. I wonder if he's still planning on stopping at uh, Dragonstone on his way. And then he'll stop at Dragonstone. Then he'll stop at the Vale to see Cat. <laughs> then they'll they'll find a reason to go back to King's Landing. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. So it's going to be a while regardless because neither of them are anywhere near making it back to Winterfell. Yeah. But uh, Bran can ride. That's nice. That's a nice. That's a nice takeaway from this. Yeah. Let's not worry about the wildlings attacking Bran. Let's not worry about the direwolves eating the gizzards out of their kills. <laughs> Bran can ride. He... Bran's riding and he's going wee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we should wrap this up for these poor people. We should, yeah. All right, as always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. You know, the other day I was trying to write our Gmail address. I say that every single week, and I couldn't remember what our <laughs> Gmail address was. I'm like, all I, have to do, all I have to do is say the words, as always, you can reach us at. Right, it would have all flowed. Yeah. But I just trying to think of it on its own. I was like, what the heck is that email address? As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Hall, Facebook, Instagram, and now YouTube. And please do reach out. We really enjoy interacting with the yes, folks that reach out. It's the best. It is. Every time someone every time someone emails us or tweets at us, we get so excited. We do. McKelly will interrupt any meeting that I'm having to tell me <laughs> that such contact has been made. You think I care that your thing says in a meeting? This is important. <laughs> Someone has... <laughs> We've had an email! <laughs> yeah, and if you wouldn't mind going out and leaving us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com, it really does go a long way in helping us get the word out. We would really appreciate that. That's why That's why we've got so many listeners. Right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.